Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast. Alex Connor here with another guest. And this week I'm talking with Jacob Skepis from JPS Health and Fitness. And I know for my Australian listeners, you will be familiar, or most of you will be familiar with JPS and Jacob himself. If not, you're about to find out. So a little bit about Jacob is he is the owner and director of JPS Health and Fitness, where he has helped thousands of individuals improve their strength, body composition, and well-being vitally through evidence-based resistance training and nutrition. So taking a scientific-based approach to training and diet has enabled Jacob to excel in a variety of sports as well, including VFL, bodybuilding, where he has won multiple state and international titles, along with competing in international powerlifting, and also at a national level achieved a top ranking of 8th within Australia. Having worked in the industry for over eight years, Jacob's wealth of knowledge, coupled with his experience in the trenches, has led him to become one of Melbourne's most sought-out trainers. His role has extended far beyond working with his beloved clients to now mentoring aspiring personal trainers, holding workshops and seminars and symposiums, and writing for the nation's personal training governing body, Physical Activity Australia. His motto is simple, whatever the mind can conceive can be achieved. And we're going to talk a lot more about a couple of those points today in this episode. I do apologize about some of the sound quality. I did have a few connection issues. However, more importantly, the information provided within this podcast is gold. If you are a trainer, currently a personal trainer, you're looking to get in the industry, within the industry as a coach, a personal trainer, a fitness instructor alike, and you want to have a successful start, you want to improve your business, your strategies, your processes, listen in closely on this one. Basic principles go a long way. Now, before we dive in, just quickly, my latest masterclass, which is Fearlessly Iconic Meal Prep, so learning how to master your meal prep, we are doing a deep dive into that this weekend. There are still a couple of tickets available. It will be held here at Icon Kitchens Sunday, the 3rd, which will be a 10.30 a.m. start. And uh, you can go to the website and purchase tickets and find out more information there. And we're going to show you all of the little intricacies which make up meal prep. So not just what meals to make, it's more about how to prepare them, how to store them, how to make them tasty, how to customize them, and how to do that in an efficient manner. Because as we know, nutrition is where it always falls down. And it's not just what we do, it's how we do it. Uh, Also, make sure if you're not already, head over to the YouTube channel if you are not there watching this, where you can watch and listen to all of these podcasts, but also tune in for weekly vlogs as well with myself, uncovering some of the most popular topics relating to training, nutrition, and lifestyle collectively. But anyway, without further ado, enjoy this latest podcast between myself and Jacob. Jacob, welcome to the Fearless Training Raw Knowledge Podcast, my friend. Thanks for joining us. Alex, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. So let's start off, as we always do, give us a bit of a background for people who may not be aware. I'm sure for the Australian listeners within our community, they may be aware of who you are, but give us a bit of background about who you are, what you do, and uh, where you're at currently. Yeah, awesome. So I guess... Fundamentally, I'm a glorified uh, PE teacher um, and I've been in the fitness industry now for nearly 10 years, uh, coaching as of 18. And I began uh, at a, my base and all of a sudden it started developing at such a rate that I had to get one of my good friends at the time on to work with me and help me with some of my clients and take some sessions for me. And then he built up his client base and I had to get my brother on. Uh, so he was uh, building up his client base. And we're still all at this facility, paying our rent, all of those sorts of things. And we're there for a couple of years and it got to the point where it didn't make much sense anymore that we were paying all this money in rent when we could probably just put that money towards you know, rent, renting our own place. So we did that. And that was officially the genesis of JPS. So we had a little personal training studio, uh, kitted out the facility, It was tiny, it was very much like a shoebox and we started getting to work. And at that point, I didn't know my ass from my head when it came to personal training, 
But what I did do well, and I think allowed me to become somewhat successful at the time, or at least successful in my own right, having a full client list and all of those sorts of things, um, was that I was very passionate about what I did and I cared a lot about the results uh, that I was producing uh, with my clients. So I you know, really focused on giving people their money's worth and more, and making sure that they got what they came for. And over time, we eventually had eight trainers in this little facility and it was too small to house all of us. So uh, we moved to our current facility, or for, uh, for memory, online coaches uh, from various states uh, in Australia, which is really, really cool. And, and yeah, we do that amongst other things. Uh, we're expanding now into the education domain. We're teaching the CERT 3 and 4. We also educate personal trainers through our mentorship program. We do seminars, uh, which I've been very fortunate to do some travel for around Australia and now internationally, which is super cool. I'm just yeah stoked to be able to do those kind of things as part of my job. It's um, yeah very, very cool. And I'm grateful for all the opportunities that I get through that. But uh, that's my coaching career. And aside all that, I've done some powerlifting. Uh, I've competed in powerlifting Australia. Nationals, I've come second twice, which is super annoying. I uh, competed in bodybuilding as well. I came second at nationals twice, which is also super annoying. Uh, so, yeah, I'm probably a better coach than I am athlete, but I give it a whirl. And, yeah, I'm very passionate about all things, uh, you know, strength, uh, performance, and physique development. Yeah, that's great. So, again, a, a multitude and a well-rounded sort of array of experience there, which is always good. Uh, it's good to lead by example. Um, despite the placings, it's more about the experience, right? But again, it is nice to take the gold sometimes. <laughs> um, that's, what, that's what we tell people when we come second anyway. Yeah, for sure. Exactly, right? It's the taking part that counts. <laughs> all right, Jacob. Well, let, let's first of all delve into more of, um, you know, you mentioned you get to travel, you get to host and educate, um, you know, and mentor well, other trainers. Can we delve into more about like how that came about? Was that just a natural progression and also like some of the, the processes and perhaps the systems behind how you create that content or like how you actually mentor people for, for the listeners? Yeah. So it wasn't by choice, put it that way. I didn't um, one day wake up and say, Hey, I want to you know mentor personal trainers. I'm going to educate you know the industry and things like this. Um, I was always big on, like educating my clients and teaching them about what we were doing, mostly because it, it helped me learn. Um, it was more of a selfish thing, to be honest. Like, so I teach my clients about what I was learning just to reinforce all that I was learning. And um, I think I you know, figured out that I've got a bit of a knack for you know, teaching people, or at least I can keep them engaged. And, get them some. and I was coaching a number of other personal trainers at uh, my first facility who were all asking me a lot of questions, wanting to know more about, um, you know, JPS, how I, you know, coach, how I program, uh, you know, nutrition, why I make certain adjustments. And then I had a couple of them ask me for mentoring and I never had a mentor. I never have been formally educated outside of my uh, certificates, although I'm now back uh, studying a graduate diploma in, performance nutrition so that's uh, a bit of an eye opener but I never went through the process that many coaches are now going through where they've got mentors they've got access to online courses uh, you know in 2009 2010 this stuff wasn't around um, and it was you know, I was young and naive and I had no idea about you know, any of these kind of things so when they asked me for mentoring I really didn't know what the hell they were talking about and um, you know I started without even charging people um, because I was just like, yeah, we'll sit down and have a coffee and I'll just, you know, run you through a few things. And then I ended up having like four or five people all wanting this mentor. And I was discussing a lot of the similar things. Um, and I obviously st st thought, Hey, maybe I should start charging for this because it's taking up a lot of time. Yeah. So it got to the point where there was just so many, uh, appointments that I had during the week for my mentorship students that I figured, got to be a better way to streamline this process because I was doing the same things, you know, to different people. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of the same questions coming up. Um, and this was probably around 2013, 2014. So I created a 12 week 
course um, for personal trainers. And um, it was basically all the things that I'd run through uh, with my individual mentorship students, um, you know, from the yeah. business side of things to, you know, programming to nutrition, teaching movements to marketing, you know, just basic stuff. It wasn't overly complex or even in depth. It was more so here's how you learn from my mistakes. You know, I've made these mistakes. Just don't do that and try to do something else and you should be better off uh, than what I am. So that's basically all it was. Um, and I ran that uh, over 12 weeks on a Tuesday, Thursday night out of our facility, our bigger facility when we moved. And that started to get to the point where it was you know, getting really, really busy. And to be honest, I was you know, just getting a little bit tired of talking about the same things over and over and over. Um, and I thought, you know, I'd love to be able to reach more people. Uh, you know, I'm obviously limited by being in Melbourne and the times were an issue for a lot of people, uh, all those sorts of things that, um, you know, can bottleneck the, the growth of a you know, service that you offer. So we moved it online and created online mentorship. And again, I wanted to make it bigger and better. So I enlisted the likes of uh, some very well-respected, knowledgeable and expert coaches, practitioners and researchers to contribute content to the course. Um, and now, yeah, the course is, it's a monster. It's, uh, yeah, there's 12 modules and there's over 40 hours of content in those modules and we keep adding to it. Our students get um, a bunch of other inclusions like a research review to mass monthly applications and strength sports. Uh, that's by Eric Helms, Greg Knuckles, Mike Zordos and Eric Trexler. Uh, they also get James Krieger's uh, weightology research review. Uh, they get an online physique contest prep course. They get a movement and screening course. They get every single presentation that we do uh, as part of our workshops or seminars uploaded to that, monthly Q&As. They get all of our resources. Um, yeah, it's like it's crazy what's in there now. And they get the UABC, which is the conference we were talking about uh, earlier. They get all the presentations from that uh, every year and they get a lifetime access. So they basically get free tickets to the UABC Um you know, each year. So we do look after our students and I guess we'll talk about these kind of things more uh, shortly when, you know, we want to be successful in the industry or stand out uh, from the crowd and how you can do that. But, you know, one of the big things I wanted to do was not just create another course that's, uh, you know, cash grab and trying to just get money and, you know, you give this course to personal trainers and it kind of ends there. I wanted it to be something that was not only very detailed, uh, in-depth and informative, um, and useful, but also something that would um, give the students to, something to be a part of to not only continue their education and development long term without any additional cost, uh, so there's no strings attached, uh, but to be a part of a community and network of other coaches who value their education as well. So it's been pretty cool to, to see all that happen. And yeah, man, that's kind of how I started it and the, the way we went about it. I'm sure you've got a few other questions or things we can talk about. Yeah, no, definitely. I think it's good to, I'd like to sort of delve into that a little bit further and, and, and unpack it a little bit more. And I like what you said there, you're providing value, you know, and not only from yourself, we kind of talked about this before we started the conversation, you know, aligning yourself with like-minded peers and practitioners and, you know, some of the best minds in the industry to kind of add that value in a holistic way so that you've got, you know, you're not only covering one facet, but it's, again, it's multidimensional. And obviously, you've got all the other, you know, benefits as well, like the in the evidence-based conference in, in Melbourne, where you know they can attend, which is great. Um, which is a bit more sort of personal, which is great. And I think that might be some of the struggles with online content, which maybe is, I think, probably a good place to to sort of unpack next and looking at, you know, what some of the challenges that you face when you're trying to deliver content in an online medium versus, you know, in person and how have you kind of rectified, avoided or learned from, from, you know, past experiences, mistakes, et cetera, try and provide a really high quality experience so that people are able to going in and, you know, they are getting that level of education that they can not only absorb, but implement as well. Yeah. So there's a big difference between delivering content online and delivering it in the flesh the most pertinent uh, issue that I faced personally when uh, creating and delivering the content was being comfortable talking to a screen. 
And that was a huge, a huge wake up call for me um, because all of my delivery of content in the past had been to an audience, albeit, you know, a number of people in a room. Um, but you have that feedback from, you know, the people who are sitting there and listening um, to base how you deliver the content, where you take, uh, you know, the discussion and so on and so forth. When you're presenting uh, on a screen and you're just recording, you don't have that feedback. So uh, it, it's a very different type of uh, discussion you're having uh, when you're recording a lecture or, you know, any kind of uh, video formatted recording on the computer. So that was a huge one for me. And just getting used to that took a lot of time. I think I recorded the first three to five lectures of the mentorship several times over because it was just weird and I was, you know, a bit of a clutch, you know, and I was you know, tripping over my words. I you know, lost my train of thought. I was like, what the hell? This is so weird. But then once I got going and I was just like, yeah, just pretend that someone's there and you're just having a conversation and have a laugh. Like don't take it too seriously. Um, you know, things got going. So that, that's a big one. The other one is obviously when you have people coming in the flesh, uh, you can build a relationship with them, um, especially when they're, you know, it's an ongoing, um, you know, service that you're delivering, like the mentorship that I used to run, where it was like coming every Tuesday, Thursday night, uh, you develop a relationship with these people. And um, yeah, that can be very powerful means of motivating them to become more excited about learning. And when you're working in the online space, uh, it becomes a lot more difficult and you have people who are not always going to be motivated uh, to learn. Like to do any kind of education online, you have to be quite uh, self-driven. Uh, whereas when you have that accountability of rocking up to a session in person, face-to-face, -face, uh, yeah, that kind of takes care of the motivation for you because somebody's depending on you or expecting you to be here at a certain time. And, uh, you know, most people generally don't want to let other people down, but they're more than okay to let themselves down, so to speak. And, you know, we see this all the time with clients and, you know, coaches are no different when it comes to their education. So they're probably the two biggest uh, things that I found challenging, at least uh, when I started transitioning from, you know, teaching in person to, to online. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, no, definitely shed some light on it. And it is it's ironic when you can be so well-versed with people in person and then you think, well, you know, it will be no, no issue going to an online medium or delivering content to a camera. But as you said, it's very different because you can gauge feedback, you know, 80% of communication, body language, you can kind of build that rapport. You can kind of, you can tailor it to that person in front of you where when there's no feedback or mirroring, if you like, it can be a little bit unnerving and all of a sudden you find yourself maybe tripping over your words and whatnot. So I think it's good. To acknowledge that and good for people to listen to uh, and understand because I think with this online platform and with Instagram and, and whatever it is, people just think that that person is always perfect where they probably didn't see the 10 takes <laughs> it took to actually get that content out. Um, so no, it's, it's, a, it's an important point to acknowledge. So from, you know, creating this uh, content and in terms of like a me media way or the actual technology that you use, did you sort of seek out people who could video this and, and capture it for you or were you already pretty good in terms of like being able to set up cameras and getting the audio right yourself to be able to, to do this? Or once again, was that more of a learning process so you could obviously deliver that sort of more higher quality content? Yeah, so initially the mentorship was pretty raw because it's just lecture recordings, uh, you know, behind a computer like what we're doing now. Uh, so the tech side of things doesn't need to be overly sophisticated. However, I did enlist the help of some experts uh, with putting together other bits of content. Uh, so we have a teaching movements course for the coaches um, and the students. So they have access to me basically demonstrating a laundry list of exercises. Um, and we got a professional to record and edit those. So they're really nice and uh, very well polished, I guess. Uh, but in terms of the recordings, man, it's, you know, it was my first go at creating an online course. Uh, you know, obviously I would much rather spend more money on 
paying, uh, you know, people to present good quality information and to get the best, uh, you know, people out there to do work uh, for the mentorship than to have a course that looks pretty, you know. Um, that will come in time. We'll definitely go through and uh, re-record and update uh, the lectures and the mentorship, um, you know, just improving the overall quality of things over time. That's something that I've always done. I'm a big believer in making your work of 12 months to go look amateur, and that's something that I live by. Um, but that will come in time. The plan is in 2020 to start reviewing the content um, after our first year in operation. So this is our only the first year since the mentorship started. And, you know, we'll get the feedback from our 150-odd students, um, you know, see what they have to say, uh, anything that they want improved, changed, they liked, didn't like, and we'll go from there. So, yeah, the first crack at it was very much about, hey, I just need to make sure the information and the content is world-class and I need to make sure that, um, you know, it's easy to use uh, from both a... Uh, you know, management as well as a user perspective. And if it ticks those two boxes for the first take, then I was super happy. Um, and then we'll polish it and, you know, refine it over time and make it look super pretty, I guess. Yeah, sure. I, I think it's important, right? And quality over quantity. And sometimes you, you get fixated on the minutia and half the time it's the consistency beats perfection. As long as it's at a standard, like you said, where the actual information is found, then okay cool we can get a nice background we can have all the videography so that's good you know you're putting your priorities where they need to be which is more in the content for you obviously you know your customers and your clientele and you talked about you know uh, a lot of your course content is you know you have access to like mass monthly applications and transport you know an amazing resource and you've got a number of peers and practitioners which obviously not only come to the conventions but you know present and help you create this content how did you go about, you know, reaching out to these people and, and collaborating with them to make this content? Was it purely just an email or was it relationships that you built up over time, like with the industry professionals? Yeah, so I'm not a fan of cold calling anyone uh, to do work for me. Uh, that's not how I operate. Um, yeah, I felt comfortable, I guess, to reach out and ask uh, the people who contributed uh, to help out with uh, the material for the course. And I think that's very important uh, that I felt comfortable because I wouldn't reach out to someone and ask them to help me if I wasn't comfortable or felt that I had done or could do something for them. And that's where, you know, I think the fact that we've, you know, we've run, you know, we had 3DMJ down under in 2017. We had the UABC in 2018 and 2019. Uh, you know, we've hosted RP, We've developed very good relationships with, uh, you know, Dan, traveled around Australia with him, presenting with him. Um, so we'd had all these kind of uh, interactions we reached and asked, uh, you know, for help or assistance in putting the, the content together. I think that's a, a huge lesson for any personal trainer or anyone listening uh, to this if they're going to you know, try to network with other professionals who are potentially a little bit more well-known, have more experience or are just you know, perceived to be at least uh, you know, of a higher caliber in the industry. Um, you, know, you need to make sure that you don't just try to get someone to help you um, because they have a lot of people who want their help and want their time and energy and effort. And that's a really quick way to have your name thrown to the stockpile of other personal trainers who want something. Um, so I think it's, it's very important to not only develop relationships, um, but to showcase that you're going to do something for someone else if you want their help down the track. Um, and not in a transactional nature necessarily, but I think just being of good faith, doing the right thing by people. Um, and yeah, I think just generally buying into them, their, their products, their services, and what they do and supporting them, um, you know, they're more than likely going to turn around and, you know, say yes if you do ask for help. But if you just, you know, send them an email, hey, you know, I'm running a course, can you present a, um, um, yeah, not confident they'll say yes, especially because many of them already have uh, commitments and, uh, you know, responsibilities to other work. Um, you know, you've always got to ask yourself the question, how will this benefit 
uh, the person on the other end. And, you know, the benefit has to be much higher if uh, there's no relationship there. So, yeah. No, that's good. That's good. I think like you said, it's having that um, empathy for the other person, having the respect. And then there has, there's got to be, to a degree, there's got to be a mutual benefit, I think, because otherwise if it's very one-sided, it's a bit selfish and it's always nice to extend, you know, the hand with something in return, whether that's exposure, whether that is, you know, a mutual business opportunity, some information or whatever it may be. So an, an important point I think you make there, Jacob. Now, to transition away from that to more, you know, we talked about uh, off the camera for personal trainers out there, to, for coaches out there, how to, you know, create a sustainable business and a successful business for the long term. What are some of the, the main things you've learned from your own experience and then perhaps moving on to now having worked and mentored so obviously you know like you said before you you learn by doing you learn by teaching others yeah so i think first and foremost um you know concept that is really beneficial for coaches to wrap their head around uh when they want to act globally as a personal trainer is what's called their value ceiling so that is the amount of value that they can offer to the client. And there are generally three pillars uh, that I see anyway to the value ceiling. Number one being their knowledge. So that's their qualifications, uh, their degrees, uh, you know, all of their intel uh, related to any specific domain of fitness, whether it's nutrition, rehab, you know, uh, muscle growth, all those sorts of things. Uh, and then the second pillar is their personal experience. So that is their own journey through fitness and what they've been able to achieve themselves. And this isn't to say that they need to have a six pack or you know, be a world-class bodybuilder, but you know, being able to demonstrate to your clients that they walk the walk, they don't just talk the talk, and that they have made some measurable progress in terms of their own fitness, whether it's improving their squat by adding you know, 20, 30 kilos over a couple of years, whatever it may be, they need to demonstrate that they've improved and that they can you know, uh, apply what they know uh, and then the third is not only can they apply it to themselves, but they need to demonstrate uh, that they can have success with other people. So their client results. So I think if you can look at these three pillars and aim sight of each pillar, that will drive your value ceiling up. So if you want to be successful as a personal trainer, you need to offer value to the client because fundamentally that is what will attract your clients uh, to hire you and to want to work with you. So uh, I think, yes, yeah, step one is to add value by providing an above average service. And that requires the skills, the knowledge, and experience. So looking at those uh, three uh, pillars of the value ceiling uh, so that they can obviously at least do a half decent job with their clients. And if you can do that, uh, I think that you're off to a great start. So that is the first thing that I'd say about wanting to develop a, a successful business is that you need to not only offer value, but you need to have uh, a point of difference. So a point of difference, I think a lot of people overcomplicate this, to be honest. Uh, you know, they think they have to be like so unique and outstanding uh, that you know, they just get bogged down in details and they end up not knowing what the hell they stand for and what they do. Uh, but the way I see having a point of difference is fundamentally one of two things. One, you do a better job than the next person. Or two, you do something different that nobody else does. Uh, and that isn't revolutionary and that's not overly complex. It's pretty simple if you fucking look at it. Um, you just got to do a better job or you just do something that other people can't do uh, for your clients. Really, really simple. So having a point of difference, I think, goes a long way. And if you look at the value ceiling, uh, your education, uh, so your, your knowledge can help you do something different. It can also help you do something better. Practicing yourself can also help you have a point of difference and so can all of your client success. So these two things really fit into one another. And I think... Uh, something else that is, is really important is when you're starting out in the fitness industry, not to try to specialize and have a specific or very confined niche uh, too early on because you will limit your potential market and that will squander uh, your growth and development as a coach fundamentally. I think you need to generalize before you specialize and only after many, many years of working with an array of people from all different walks of life Will you be able to say, hey, I'm actually really good at coaching this type of person and I'm really interested in this type of thing. Maybe now that I have all this, these clients who are doing you know, this thing and 
the, the one area that I really, really love, I can start to cut off a few of those other clients who maybe might not be, um, you know, training for the same goals that I'm really interested in or that I'm actually good at helping them at. And I can want to work only with bodybuilders and they don't want to work with, you know, everyday mum and dads. But at the end of the day, um, you know, your regular Joe Blows, they're the ones paying the bills. Uh, you know, they're the ones who need the personal training. And they're generally the clients who you're going to learn the most from because uh, they will challenge you in other ways uh, that sometimes the athletes and the, you know, demographics and populations that are you know, perceived as quote unquote ideal um, wouldn't. So, so that is a, a third thing that I would say in building a sustainable and successful business. A uh, fourth would be developing a pretty good understanding of the services that you offer and making sure that you can deliver an exceptional, above average, or unique service to the client. And this just requires experience, requires care and you know, passion, well as you know, a bit of dedication. There's not much that you, you need to know about that. It's just you need to think about the services you offer and you know, really dial them in and make sure that you're offering a, a kick-ass service. Uh, and then the final thing would be to have systems around those services, uh, so processes for simple things like your lead generation, uh, your consultations, your screenings, your programming, your check-ins and updates, your referrals, uh, and then marketing. And, and fundamentally, they're, just, they're all the key things you need in terms of having a system for your business. Um, and being able to conceptualize how they all work in together and potentially piecing uh, you know, a model around your business um, that can help outline how each of those uh, various systems will feed into one another and create a sustaining organism, so to speak, uh, is how you can uh, go about at least making sure that you've got some plan uh, when you enter the fitness industry as opposed to just you know chasing you know, consults or leads from uh, the facility that you work at and, you know, doing all the other funnel shit that people do online. I don't even understand what these fucking funnels are. But anyway, all those things, I think uh, they should be the icing on the cake, not the meat and potatoes of uh, your sustainable personal training business. Uh, and marketing should only be done and prioritized when you've got something to fucking market. And that should generally be your client results your knowledge or your own personal experience because they are the things uh, that are going to demonstrate to your you know, uh, potential clients, your prospects, uh, that you have some value to offer. Um, trying to tell them that they can you know, get cheap personal training for you know, $2.99 for 10 sessions or seven-day free, uh, seven free trial, these kind of things, that's not offering value to anyone. And that's just attracting the wrong type of person, in my opinion. Um, if someone doesn't value your service to the point where they're going to pay and hand over money, uh, why have them at all? They're not going to stay with you for very long. They just want the free ride and then they'll fuck off. So making sure that you're putting out uh, informative content or that can help people um, and you know, getting the word out there and just helping people in general, whether it's you know, training someone for free, whether it's helping a friend or family member out, uh, you know, showing them that you have this, uh, knowledge, experience, and uh, ability to help will go a long way in help generating leads and yeah, sustaining a business. I think the best thing you can ever do is uh, ensure that you look after your clients and put them first, put your clients second, and then put your clients third. And that's uh, one of our yeah, value statements here at JPS. Yeah. No, I, I, amen, brother. You made a lot of really good key points there, and I like how you for the most part, simplified it and put it into sort of a bit of a system of and an order of priority. I think just to reiterate, again, in, in ASAM, and please correct me if I'm not getting this, but again, it's about starting with those basic fundamentals and learning to walk before you can run and understanding the process because, again, perhaps from social media, a lot of trainers now are going, cool, I'm going to be this online fucking phenomenon. Uh, or I'm going to try do that where even sometimes the person who looks like the online phenomenon is just burning people because they're just selling these discounted programs. But, uh, one other key point I think is really important. And I'm going to, I'm just going to reiterate this because I think it's good, Jacob, is that you talked about when you go into the industry, do not try and specialize too early or pigeonhole yourself because you will miss out on the opportunity to not only learn and gain more experience, but also to figure out the hack what clientele or what, you know, I, I don't like the whole way people talk about ad card too much because sometimes the demographic, yeah, yeah. It just reminds me of the movie and like this, uh, 
strange looking alien kind of human thing. Right, exactly. I've always been a bit of a pet hate, man. People go, you watch your avatar, what's your demographic? And I'm like, well, I've got 16 year old clients and 65 year old clients. And what I've come to the realization of through my years of coaching up to now is that I look not for a physical attribute anymore. For me, I'm look for the mental. I look for an attitude. I look for people who want more than average. And I found by, again, not discounting my services, being open and also spending time by giving above and beyond and sort of qualifying or spending time with people and having that value ceiling she talked about, you actually start to attract more and more and more of these higher caliber, if you like, quality clientele, which are there for the long run and they're not in for the quick ride. So a couple of things I want to um, address there, which I, I think is really important, not only from my own perspective, but I know a lot of trainers will get a lot out of this, is the first one is the discounting of your services. It's something that I've never believed in. I don't think, obviously, go in and charge the earth. You've got to come in with something reasonable to, again, depending on where you are to a degree. But I am the, in the the mindset of, I think if you are good at what you do, you will find, like, you will get people to value, you will show value and people, doesn't matter where you are, um, people will pay for something they value because it's perception, right? And if you can provide that, then people will come up and people go, oh, there's no money. It's like, well, no, 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 maybe you're just not providing enough value. So um, I'd like you to talk through a little bit more of that first and then perhaps just a two-part question with not only perhaps not discounting your services and why not to, to discount your services, but also to, and this is a big one. Now, we know there's coaches out there who charge apparently thousands of dollars an hour, right? A lot of trainers want to know how to get there, but they don't really know the steps if you need to get there in general. I think a big misconception is not only the process for getting there, but also the scalability of how to do that. Because, for example, it might be that, again, you're not just doing a one-on-one, -on -one, perhaps, again, like yourself, there's not only the one-on-one -on -one element, but there's then all of these other resources. So the value of the package is more, or perhaps it's the one-to-many where, again, you're doing symposiums and, and master classes where you could say, well, I technically am getting a thousand dollars an hour now because I've got, you know, X amount of people in here. So technically I'm speaking for an hour and it's a hundred dollars ahead. So there's a thousand dollars. So maybe there's a bit of, you know, advertising that's going on there, like learn how to charge 2000 an hour. So if you could address those two points first, Jacob, please. Um, that would that would be, I think that would be great for the listeners. Yeah, for sure. So I'm going to counter the first point and say that you should discount your services. And you, most coaches are going to be thinking about, well, why should I discount my services? Well, I don't think you should discount your services because a client wants a discount. If they come up to you and say, hey, can I get this cheaper? And they try to haggle and bargain you down like you're at the fruit market. Uh, I think you can, you know, stick in the middle finger and say, and kindly say, you know, get the fuck out of my face. Um, but if you have a loyal client who's been working with you for many, many years and over time your prices go up as they generally should, which is the second point of your question, I think you should honor their price or at least give them a discount for their loyalty. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a very big dis difference between giving a loyalty discount or a like VIP say discount where it's like maybe friends, family uh, or exceptional circumstances, you know, someone's, you know, a partner or spouse, whatever it might be. Um, you, you might offer a discount then. So I think having VIP and loyalty discounts, uh, certainly fine, but it's on your terms, not the clients. And that's the fundamental difference. And I think, yes, coaches should certainly be very steadfast in their opinions um, and uh, how they charge and yeah, offer their services to clients. They shouldn't be negotiating on their price. Uh, even if it means losing a sale, uh, you're better off losing that sale and, you know, respecting your time uh, as a professional, because I don't know any other professions where people go to work and their boss haggles them down and asks them to work for less, le a lesser rate, uh, you know, per hour. That just doesn't happen. Uh, so yeah. why is the personal training industry? Uh, in the fitness industry, any different? It's not, and it shouldn't be, and people need to respect that. And the second part of your question, in terms of scaling uh, your prices up over time, I think you need to have demand, and it, it's a tricky one because oftentimes we don't know what we're worth. Are we worth all the hours and uh, education that we've acquired over many, many years? You can't put a price on that. Are we worth all of the first place uh, you know, pro cards that we get with our clients? We'll put a price on that either. 
and you know, to a degree, you can potentially price yourself out of the market and you'll have no work then. Uh, and that's not beneficial either. So I've, I've tried over the years to just make really small and incremental uh, adjustments to my price um, to reflect what I think is fair and what I'm worth. Um, and over time, you know, my online coaching started at $120, uh, you know, four years ago, and it's now up to $350. So things have uh, increased quite a bit uh, over the couple of years, but, um, you know, I'm still cheaper than online services for what offer. Um, and the same with our personal training services, you know, back in the day, I'm um, talking 10 years ago, a 10 pack of personal training sessions uh, was $300. And now, uh, you know, it's nearly uh, $600 for 10 personal training sessions. Uh, so our sessions have, you know, nearly doubled, but that's over the course of 10 years. So it's been a slow, you know, went to 350, then 450, 500, 550, you know, it's like slowly, slowly over the year. And as I said, we've honored discounts, you know, 10% or 15% uh, loyalty and VIP discounts to our long-standing clients. So, you know, whenever the prices go up, they still get it at a cheaper rate. Um, but it's obviously, you know, fair to reflect any, you know, um, economic changes and so on and so forth and the increasing value that we're offering as a result of more experience and more knowledge over the years. I like how you clarify the difference between when and how to give a discount and the context. I think that's important. I do agree with loyalty that is something i always say i honor loyalty and i think you should and but the the key difference is what you said on your terms and sometimes it might be by giving more value or and again always i think you should always under promise over deliver go above and beyond and it it might be the difference that you know you always give the extra five to ten minutes and it's not okay it's exactly three o'clock see you later the bell's gone it you know, if that client needs that little bit more time and, you know, that comes down to organizing yourself as well. And the client, if they value, they'll notice that over the years. I'm like, oh, you know, he always, he doesn't, it's not always to the dot, you know, like he sometimes gives a little bit more or she gives a little bit more. So I think that's a good point you make. And over time, that is something that, again, you, you'll find that you'll have those clients sticking with you and they'll go, look, we do value you. We'll walk up there, but I'll also give something back. So it's a bit of a push-pull. Like, you've you got to give to take a little bit. So um, important on that point. I really like. Now, going sort of to segue a little bit more on that, what have you additionally learned in terms of, you know, again, same thing, sustainability for the personal trainer, for the coach, in terms of now coaching others, but then now freeing up more time. How have you sort of segregated? What's been, what does that journey look like and, and maybe we need to sort of zoom out and you need to go back from the start where you started personal training to now where you're doing online. Like, how do you cap your numbers? How do you manage your time? Obviously, you've got, you know, you run a business, you've got um, employees now, you've got online coaching. I imagine you still do some one on ones, you're doing your, your, your course and content. How have you found you, you organize that? How you progress? And then, you know, what are some systems that you've used to be able to keep yourself on the ball, organized and productive? Yeah. Three tips, caffeine, no sleep, and no social life. That's about it. You do those three things and you will be successful. Um, no. Uh, jokes aside, I think over time, once I started to get more experience and expertise in the personal training domain, so that is one-on-one -on -one personal training, um, I started to diversify the services that I offered. And I think this really important to minimize this risk to increase potential profitability if you start to uh, offer services and products that are more scalable because obviously personal training uh, isn't really scalable because we're limited by our time. So what I started to do was online coaching because that's less time intensive and I can work with more people. Um, so I started to develop that facet of my coaching. Then I started to develop the products and other services like the mentorship, our templates, our 10 weeks to lean. Uh, so I'm not necessarily doing different things. They're all much of the same, applying the same information, knowledge, and expertise, but just to slightly different uh, audiences, right? So our 10-week Selene is for people who maybe don't want to do online coaching or personal training, but they want to do something. It's like an easy you know, entry point. And then we have our online coaching if they can't get to our facility, if they can get to that facility, one-on-one -on -one, uh, kind of touch, and they can do the personal training. Um, if they can't afford the personal training, they can do the semi-private. 
um, you know, if they're a coach and they want to learn, they can come to a seminar. If they want to you know, do something a little bit more intensive, they can do the mentorship, so on and so forth. So there's just all these little branches that have diversified, uh, you know, the core of the business, um, still operating under the same umbrella, the same mission, the same values, and a lot of the same key principles and concepts, uh, but just a slightly different audiences. And I think over time, just adding little, uh, you know, notches to your belt, uh, so to speak, and having more tools in your toolbox and being able to add value to different audiences without necessarily you know, or wheelhouse uh, can be really beneficial in helping you develop a business that becomes self-sustaining and doesn't rely solely and wholly on a single service um, that is entirely dependent on your time. Um, and because we know how, you know, doing, you know, 30, 40, 50 hours a week of, uh, you know, personal training, that's very taxing. So you know, if you can start to add in these other elements to your business over time, hopefully uh, it becomes less of a, a burden and time intensive on the floor working one-on-one -on -one with people because that's also draining and you can do other things that are, you know, interesting, fun, cool. Uh, you don't need to rely as much on the personal training. I think that will help the sustainability of your, uh, your business. Yeah, no, that's good. That's not very succinctly put as well. I think it's important for a lot of trainers to realize that progression. And I know something that I struggled with initially was, you know, figuring out well, how do you get from sort of here, you know, metaphorically speaking, to sort of here, um, and, and what does that journey look like? And again, I think it's coming back to those little things. It's not about reinventing the wheel. It's just diversifying what you already do into perhaps other, you know, um, bite size or absorbable pieces of content depending on you know does the person want something more intensive can they afford that or hey look i'm not really sure i want to dip my toes in here's some perhaps free content or even like you said you know a seminar or something to get them going which has been great um so moving on where do you see yourself uh jps in the future where where's the vision where do you want to go i imagine obviously you want to continue building on the success we touched base on you know you want to extrapolate you want to keep improving um, the content that you're doing is there any other change of directions is there anything specifically that you're working on now yourself or obviously with with your uh, with your team yeah uh, a couple of things we want to take over the labor party in australia and <laughs> once we master that and we're in the political domain and we have full autonomy and a monopoly over the fitness industry we'll then take over fitness worldwide no i'm kidding um <laughs> no, <laughs> you know what's scary, Alex? Uh, I did a, a yeah. personal development task where you sit down and write out your dream job um, as a description. It's a piece where you just write out like, you know, where you are, what you're doing, who you're with, what it's like, what a day in your life, in your uh, you know, world will look like. And it's now. Like I had in there that I was running mentorships personal trainers around the world. I was traveling to present and talk. Uh, you know, I had a facility, you know, doing uh, 400 plus sessions a week. And, you know, I had a full client list and just coaching primarily bodybuilders and powerlifters and people that I wanted. And, you know, that was from a career point of view amongst other things in my personal life and stuff like that. Um, and I was like, holy fucking shit, that's what I'm doing. Like, <laughs> how the hell did that happen? Which is kind of scary because I haven't actually, you know, sat down to sort of say, well, where do I want to be next? Because I've still been working towards those things. I, you know, it's one of the interesting things about life. You know, we can set goals and often they're lofty. And when they're lofty goals, you know, we kind of in the back of our head think that, yeah, I want to achieve this, but it probably won't happen. Um, you know, and if you do achieve those lofty goals and, you know, those pipe dreams, so to speak, uh, you kind of find yourself in a point where you're sitting down thinking, fuck, how did that happen? And what do I do now? Like, what, what is going on? And that's kind of where I've been at. Um, so I guess more of the same on my end for, you know, the next six months, we've already started planning, uh, 2020 and the way that we're going to launch into the new year and the five and 10 year plan, uh, is basically just to continue to grow, um, you know, what we're doing now. Uh, I would love to have coaches, um, you know, with their masters, PhDs, uh, that's a big goal of mine is to facilitate uh, their careers and push them to become the best that they can be because everything will sort of follow from there. Um, to also continually produce phenomenal results with my clients um, and then put on kick-ass seminars in Australia 
um, bring together the, the best of the best as well as uh, do our best to educate the industry and just continue to raise the standard, man. Like that's, that's the mission, just raise the standard both within my four walls of JPS and, you know, the industry that I'm a contributor to, um, you know, if that's my mission, I'm sure that it'll uh, calibrate my uh, business and my behavior and all those sorts of things to p pursue that and hopefully navigate towards, you know, success. Mm. And, and I think that is key, right? That's something that a lot of people on our level, I think, are in, in the same boat with in terms of like, let's raise the industry standard and it needs, it needs to be raised. It definitely needs to be raised. I think one of the conflicting, um, facts is that some of the best strength and conditioning or coaches and personal trainers exist in Australia. They do. Um, in this part of the world, it's notorious because of, you know, the weather, the demographics, but also we have some of the worst as well. Um, because of, again, the systems that are out there and people, again, as we talked about off camera, being able to get their search, uh, so easily. And perhaps there's not, again, enough support systems. So having people like yourself and organizations and other peers and practitioners, you know, continually working together, covering more and more and more, creating more of an awareness. And hopefully, like you said, we'll continue to exponentially increase the industry standard. So I think that's important. I respect that, Jacob, something that I'm trying to contribute um, to myself. And I appreciate you sharing that knowledge and, and keep on doing the, the good work that you do. Um, now, before, just because we're coming to time, and um, I want to ask some questions. They're a little bit more lighthearted than I always do, a bit more rapid fire, uh, a bit more fun, and uh, before the sort of more final, uh, more serious questions. They're a bit thought provoking. Um, whatever comes to mind, answer them. Uh, so the first one is, and they're a bit uh, off topic, some of them, is if you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? I would love to travel through time because I think history and the future are both two very influential uh, means of determining what happens in the present. And I think if I could yeah, go back in time and learn and go in the future and yeah, see what's out there and what's ahead for human existence uh it'd be super super cool and i think i would yeah be able to learn a lot from that and i like learning mm, mm. okay so based on that answer if you could go back in time and speak to yourself at the start of your personal training career and you had one minute what advice would you give yourself don't rush Patience. that's it <laughs> yeah yeah that's it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i like it i'm gonna take that on board myself then um okay you what is uh you know your favorite meal this can be let's put it in context you competed in bodybuilding you finished the show okay what what are you craving you've got you've got a three course meal appetizer dinner dessert you can have a drink what is what does jacob's meal look like what's your favorite food my favorite meal uh Okay, so I'm a massive sweet tooth, but for now, I would have some form of fish, love fish, I love steak and chips, and for dessert, any kind of ice cream, preferably cookies and cream or salted caramel. Nice. Nice. Watch and Diet Coke. <laughs> of course, this is, it's the standard of things. But it's weird because I don't like Coke. Never, and I, I'm like an outlier. You're like, what do you mean you don't like Coke? I'm like, I've never liked Coke. Anyway. It's not a bad that, thing, man. Exactly. That, well, that's what I think now. So when I was younger, I was like, oh, I wish I would like it. But now it's like, oh, maybe not a bad thing. Um, and on to my final question, Jacob, which is a bit more serious. Uh, I asked all my guests, this is the last question. Can you identify a fear in your life? It can be big, it can be small, whatever has meaning. Uh, identify the fear that you had and how you overcame it and what you took from that experience or overcoming that fear. Yeah, so for 
one of my biggest fears when uh, I was young, at least. And I think there's two parts to my biggest fear. The first one is not being liked. Uh, so I always wanted to be friends with everyone. I wanted to be popular and you know, fit in. So that was a big fear of mine growing up, um, which in my formative years was quite uh, yeah, influential on the person that I became. And the second part of that fear, uh, that fear is not only the fear of not being liked, but the fear of disappointing someone. So you combine those two fears and I have a very high uh, propensity to want to please others and do my best not to disappoint. Um, and that comes a lot of positive, but also a lot of drawbacks. I often take on more than I can handle. Um, I say yes, and I'm very uh, agreeable in nature. Um, and obviously the benefits are that, you know, I do care about the people that, uh, and, and I myself try to help people. And I think that's, uh, yeah, important in the service-based industry, like personal training. Mm, for sure. I think, and a lot of us listening can probably relate to that, you know, in the coaching sphere, I think we, yeah we share similar attributes, especially the genuine coaches. I think, you know, we're very empathetic and we're probably very self-critical as well. Um, but no, thank you for sharing, Jacob. And but before you go, for the people who want to find out more about you and, and perhaps they want to get in contact and they want to experience some of the services, they want to come to the seminars, the evidence-based conferences, et cetera, where are some of the best places to find uh, yourself and JPS? Yeah, so the website is just www.jpshealthandandfitness.com.au, uh, Instagram, JPS Health and Fitness, and then uh, we have JPS uh, Education, uh, that's our, as the name suggests, education page on Instagram, and then my personal account, if you want to follow someone that doesn't really tell you much except bad dad jokes and pretty much take the piss out of all of his clients and uh, bits and pieces like that, you can follow me at Jacob Skepis, S C H E P I S uh, underscore J P S, and that's where you'll find me. Awesome, thanks, dude. And I will make sure I put those links, well, as always, in the show notes below <laughs> for people who want to have a bit of bit of humour and perhaps some education as well at the same time. Um, so, Jacob, thank you for your time <laughs> again. Uh, it's been it's been good. I think there's been a lot of golden nuggets in between. Do apologise about some of the connection issue, guys. Was working on that there, but um, again, not a problem. Covered covered some, um, I think, some really key topics that are really helpful for a lot of trainers, and um, especially things close to my heart. So look, it'd be great to possibly go over these in more detail, or perhaps explore other avenues within these realms. We'd we'll be happy to do so at another stage, Jacob. Yeah, man, that would be awesome. Yeah. Awesome, and um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you again for your time, mate. We, we appreciate it. My All pleasure. Right. Thanks so much for having me on, Alex. Oh anytime all right guys um until next time as always i uh, will be seeing you next week another episode so in the meantime stay fearless